This is going to be verse by verse of the book of Joel, chapter 1. And in this chapter, I'm going to give you some reasons why I'm ready to leave this present evil world. Number one is because men hate the words of God. In Joel 1, in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. So do you remember when the word of the Lord came to you? The word of the Lord came to Joel. I remember the day he enlightened me on the King James Bible, and it just clicked in my soul that it was the true word of God. I was ignorant of it at the time. I thought every version came from God, but he showed me what the Lord of the word of the Lord was that day. And many other times that he showed me something, the word of the Lord comes to you. The word of the Lord comes to you in a King James Bible. The word of the Lord came to the prophets through dreams and visions many times, which it doesn't come that way to us today because we have a complete written word of God. Now, Joel got words from the Lord. He didn't have a complete Bible all the way back then, but God spoke to man through dreams and visions. Just like he did in Genesis 15, 1. It says, After these things the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision. In 1 Kings 3, 5, it says, In Gibeon the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. So, now that we have a complete Bible, God only talks to us through the written, written word of God in the Bible that you hold in your hand. He's not talking to you through dreams and visions. You're going to notice that Joel is a doom and gloom preacher. He's a hellfire preacher. He has a very, very negative message. And for this reason, people will hate the words. The Bible is a negative book that gives people a bad outlook on themselves. I know of two preachers named Joel. This Joel the prophet that we're going to talk about today and Joel Osteen. These guys are complete opposites. Joel is a real man for God, while Joel Osteen deceives people through good words and fair speeches. But you're going to think, many people's going to think, well, Joel Osteen is more of a Christian than the prophet Joel. Because they're going about, you know, if, is he positive or is he negative? But as Paul said in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? No. I'm looking forward to the day when I'll live with other people who love the Word, love to talk about the Word, and learn things about the Word. They just love it. Until then, I'm setting my affection on things above. Until then, I'm trying to set up for myself treasures in heaven and live like I'm leaving. Packed up, prayed up, ready to get picked up, as they say. So the word of the Lord comes to Joel, and Joel's name means Jehovah is God. People don't like those words because they want to be God. Uh, Joel is the son of Bethuel, His, and uh, Bethuel means sincerity of God. Men don't like those words because they hate God. They attempt to make God a mean God. I don't, I'm, I don't want to be like them. I want to be a sincere, Bible-believing Christian. I don't want any wicked motives behind why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want God to get the glory. I want Christians to get interested in the Bible. They say, why don't you put your name on here and your picture and all that so everybody will know who you are. But I just want to stay away from any temptation to self-promote. I've tried to. I don't want anyone to think I'm trying to self-promote myself. I just want to promote Jesus Christ and the Bible. But I'm ready to leave this world because men hate the words. In Joel 1, 2, it says, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? So people today don't don't hear because they don't want to hear. They don't hear the words of God. Imagine what they did when Joel preached. I think it was John Wesley who kept going to churches and they wouldn't have him back because of what he said. He wrote about that in his diary. And that's probably the way it was for Joel. Joel says, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear. The thing about the old men is they should know better. If you can get older men, then they can affect their families and the younger men. But the older men today are still acting like the younger men. 
But Joel says to the old men, Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? I believe Joel is probably talking about something that was going on back then to a certain extent. But you have to remember, the book is still prophecy. I believe he's prophesying about the tribulation time period. And he's saying to these old men, Have you ever seen anything like this? It reminds me of what Jesus said when he prophesied about a time so bad that men haven't seen anything like it. As he talked about in Matthew twenty four twenty one, he said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So this is the type of words that man doesn't want to hear. They don't want to hear that there's bad things coming. But verse 3 says, you should. In Joel 1, 3, it says, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. You ought to want to tell people what's coming, even if they don't want to receive it. But what's wrong with this world is the kids aren't getting these negative words passed on to them. And I'm sure you've read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it talks about you need to pass these words on. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8, it says, And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine head, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So tell your children, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell them about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, his shed blood. Tell them that the devil and devils want to destroy them. Tell them about godly separation from the sinful things of the world. Tell them that they are sinners. And these are negative messages, but it's what they need to hear. This world is so stupid and overly sen sensitive. Some people... Uh, heard me telling my daughter that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And they said, I can't believe you're saying that word in front of your daughter. They said, that is, that is out of line. But the virgin birth is a fundamental of the Christian faith. The virgin birth is, is what makes Jesus Christ God. Uh, they won't tell their kids about the virgin birth but they'll let them watch Netflix. They'll let them play Fortnite. They'll let them listen to uh, all these rappers and singers. But I can't tell my daughter about the virgin birth. I think there's a wicked spirit behind that that told them to say not to tell my daughter that. Uh, the virgin birth is one of the most important doctrines in the Bible. If Jesus Christ wasn't born of a virgin then that means he wasn't God. But in the last days of the church age, before the days of the tribulation, kids are going to be disobedient to parents, and the parents should tell their children, and their children tell their children about what's right and wrong. But I'm ready to leave this world because the world hates the word of the Lord. And I'm ready to leave this world because it's bugged. In Joel 1, four it says, That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. So the tribulation is going to have some nasty, creepy crawlers and germs and make the coronavirus look like the sniffles. And the sniffles will keep men out of work a lot today. But it's going to be bad in the tribulation. It says in Matthew 24, 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. It's going to be bugged. This world is going to be bugged in the tribulation. There's going to be pestilences. Anything caused by pests, it's going to be going on. The people in this world are bug-eyed. They'll bug you to death. Uh, the government wants complete control and they have things bugged to get your information about you. And in the trib, they'll have everything completely bugged. But Joel is talking about these insects here, the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar. I don't know if you know this, but in Revelation chapter 9, it shows you that there is going to be a plague of locusts 
and not any ordinary type of locusts, but devilish locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit. And this is prophesied in the Old Testament. Still found in the Old Testament when Moses brings the locust plague on Egypt. Like Solomon said, that which hath been is that which shall be. So you're reading history, things that happened in the past when you read the Old Testament, but you're also reading the future. This world doesn't have anything on eternity. Eternity is going to be a million times better than this, infinite times better. People love this present evil world, but you need to be ready to leave this present evil world. Jesus said in John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, the house we're going to have will not have a pest problem. It's not going to be bugged. No spiders, no roaches, no ants, no locusts, no bloodsuckers, no cameras spying on you. But the nicest mansion in this earth would have bugs in it. But we're going to have something from another world. In the tribulation time period, you'll see the devilish locusts, as I was telling you about in Revelation chapter 9. You can read that. And imagine the horror of the tribulation. You know... Well, you know what, though? I'm not worried about that because I'm saved and I'm going out before that takes place. She said, well, you don't know what you're talking about because you believe, you believe you're going through the tribulation. So you're saying, hey, I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, well, there is still no need to be afraid because God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. Another reason I can't feel at home in this world is because of alcohol and drugs. Everybody is drunk or stoned or are lit, as they say, or messed up, or high as a kite, or drunk, or whatever they call it now. That's another reason I'm ready to leave this prison of a world is because of alcohol and drugs. I'm tired of seeing what that does to people. I'm tired of seeing that ruin my family and other people's families. In Joel 1 5, it says, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. There are two kinds of wine in the Bible. Isaiah 65, 8 says, New wine is found in the cluster. That is just grape juice. Proverbs 3, 10 talks about presses that burst with new wine. So that can't be fermented alcohol if it just came from the presses. It's grape juice. So every time you see wine in the Bible, that doesn't mean an alcoholic drink. It can mean just grape juice. You need to know the difference. If the tri In the tribulation, there's going to be a time... When that stuff gets cut off from their mouth. In the trib, there will be times when you can't even find water to drink. And all these guys saying Jesus Christ drank alcohol and all that. So at the second coming, Jesus comes back with the rage of a drunken man. Psalm 78, 65 and 66 says, Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts and put them to a perpetual reproach. Jesus won't drink alcohol with you, but if you're not saved, you'll drink the wine of the wrath of God. As it says in Revelation 14.10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. With all this alcohol and drugs... The men today just don't take care of their families. Mothers don't love their children. People kill each other over it. I'm ready to get out of this world because of all the junk. And another reason I'm ready to get out of this present evil world is because somebody's always trying to start something. Everywhere you go, at work, just driving down the road, you're getting blown at, you get ran over with a buggy at Walmart. Somebody's always trying to start something. A nation's always trying to get at another nation. You know, people just hate each other. They can't get along. Joel 1, 6 says, For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. So the nations of this world are always trying to start something. Just like they did all the way through the Bible. People in this world are always trying to start something with somebody can anybody just leave somebody alone? Uh, when I hear about somebody robbing someone or killing someone, 
I think to myself, why can't people just leave people alone? Why can't you get up and go to work, provide for your family, after work's over, come home, take care of your family, leave everybody else alone? The world would be so much better if people did that. I wish everybody thought that way. I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone. We wouldn't have to lock our doors. We wouldn't have to worry about our kids getting kidnapped and raped by some pervert. There is always a lion lurking around the corner. As that verse talked about, lions. Many times we bring it on ourselves. You see, Israel would have adversaries sin against them because God would be judging them with that adversary. And I'm sure you remember when Solomon got away from the Lord, the Lord brought on an adversary against him as a thorn in the flesh. As it says in 1 Kings eleven fourteen, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. So if you're having trouble with people giving you a hard time for no reason, it could be because God's judging you for something, possibly. But if that's going on, just be nice to the person. Let the Lord handle the person because, he, as he says in Romans twelve nineteen. Avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So the Lord may raise up an adversary against you to punish you or test you. If you let the Lord do the avenging, let him have it, then you pass the test. God will punish them for punishing you. As he says in Second Thessalonians 1, 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Joel one six says, For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Every Christian needs to realize he's going to face lions. First Peter five eight says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You need to realize that only a bigger lion can deliver you from the lions, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah as it calls them in Revelation 5.5, 5, and you'll see that the Lord delivers His people from the lions throughout the Scriptures. You know how He shut the, the mouth of the lions in the story of Daniel and the lion's den? He delivered Benaiah. In First Chronicles 11.22, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzal, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. God... Let him do that. God gave him victory over the lions. He delivered Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 7. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, but my, but by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So there are lions coming against us, but we have a bigger lion living in us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see that the Antichrist in Revelation 13, 2, the beast, which is the Antichrist, had a mouth of a lion. So this book of Joel is so prophetic, yet the commentators think it's just history. They just wrote it off as that just happened back then. But these minor prophets, they're not only history, but they're prophecy. They can also be instruction for me and you to live right. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to read it, give you instruction to live by. Joel 1, six For a nation has come upon my land, strong without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. When God says, my land, he's referring to Israel, that's his land. Jesus Christ will reign in Jerusalem, that is the city of the great king. So be watchful, because the lions are seeking to devour. I'm ready to leave this world because God's going to fix things where me and the lion can be friends. As it says in Isaiah eleven six, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. So in the millennial kingdom, you'll be able to play fetch with a lion. Like you just got a new dog or something, you can play with the lion. You can name him, have him as a pet, let him sleep at the edge of your bed. I'm, I'm not going to because I don't like animals. But you could do that in the millennial kingdom. Joel 1, 7, He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Israel is referred to as a vine. 
Israel is also referred to as a fig tree. If the nation, as a lion, barked his fig tree, then he knocked, he knocked the bark off of it and made it white. So there is always somebody trying to start something with somebody. That's why I'm ready to leave this world. Joel 1.8 says, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. A virgin woman who is about to get married, but her husband ends up dying. Her soon-to-be husband ends up dying as some of the most horrible pain to be felt. Looking into the future, though, Israel will be a virgin again that will be restored. Romans 11.26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Israel will be restored. Israel is not the church. There's a difference. Joel 1.9, The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. So the priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn because they got the leftovers of the offering. As you see in Leviticus 2.10, And that which is left... Of the meat of the offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. So the meat offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. So the the Lord the priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. They because they got the leftovers until then. So I'm ready to leave this world because everything in it is temporary. I could be out of food in two weeks, just like these priests are gonna be it that we're gonna be out. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Look at Joel 1.10, The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new, li new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. All this stuff is temporal things. Be, ash be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Here on earth, you have to worry about all the corn, the grape juice, the wheat, the barley, and all the food being gone. People down here are worried about toilet paper being gone. In eternity, I'm not even going to need any toilet paper, and I'm going to have more food than I know what to do with, and can't even gain weight when I eat it. That's why I'm ready to leave. All these good things are in eternity. All these temporal things are down here on this earth. Joel one twelve the vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. God doesn't care about the green movement. And you see, all this, this is history. It happened back then, but it's happening in the future. God doesn't care about the green movement. If you read the book of Revelation, he's burning the trees up, the grass up, everything up. And he'll let... That stuff died just as a judgment on rebellious people. Even in the tribulation, God kills some trees. But that's you know, I'm ready to leave this world because it's temporal. And I'm ready to leave this world because people don't have no mind for the Lord. People don't have a mind for Him. Even going through troubles, they run to the things of the world for help. They think they can get enough supplies to make it. They think they can get enough supplies in their house to make it through. Joel one thirteen says... Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. How, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. People don't want to mourn, as the verse tells you to do. They don't want to weep to get God's attention. They want to live in pleasure, even though she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. But verse 13 is what... Israel will have to do to bring the second coming when they get in the tribulation. If they want that second coming, they're going to have to weep and howl and lie all night in prayer. Then the Lord will come to deliver. Verse 14, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. The Bible says, Draw nigh to God. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. 
If you're away from God, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some Christian people think that God doesn't want to be their friend or fellowship with them because of something that they've done in the past, but God actually wants to fellowship with you more than you do with Him. That's why He created man. And then when man sinned, he still wanted fellowship so badly that he died for us on the cross so that we could be reconciled back to him. And that is why he made a way that even after you're saved, you could confess your sins to stay in close fellowship. He's much more long-suffering, forgiving, and merciful than you are. But I'm ready to leave this world because there are scary days ahead. And I don't want to be on the receiving end of that stuff. In Joel one fifteen it says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So the day of the Lord refers to when the Lord is coming back with ten thousands of his saints. It's going to be a time of destruction. The day of the Lord also includes the entire millennial reign, which is a thousand years, because as Peter says in Second Peter three eight, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, in a thousand years as one day. So let's look at some other places the day of the Lord is mentioned in Isaiah 2.12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Imagine being some big shot person or the Antichrist or the false prophet seeing the Lord Jesus Christ ripping through the clouds like a lion with his eyes as a flame of fire. You talk about being brought low. You know that feeling you get in your stomach when you're afraid? Everything those men have in their body is going to fall out their hind end. In Psalms, it says he's going to smote them in their hinder parts. Men don't talk about the second coming because it's completely horrifying. The Lord Jesus Christ and his invincible army are going to come out of the clouds and trample everyone like a bunch of grapes. And the blood is going to go up to the horse's bridles. And it's, you can read about the day of the Lord all through the Bible. And since the day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, the day of the Lord isn't just the second coming. It covers a whole bunch of stuff. But primarily it's referring to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what are their idols going to do for them in that day when Jesus comes back? Are they going to be able to help the people, these idols? Isaiah 2.19, it says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. All these big shots and tough guys are going to run like a bunch of scared babies. Somebody said, When I see God, I'm going to cuss Him. How stupid. So you're going to cuss someone out who could just look at you and you would blow up. That's being a fool. Isaiah 2.20, and that in that day, that's the day of the Lord, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. Notice that phrase, in that day. These phrases, in that day and the day of the Lord, are such key phrases in your Bible. They describe these scary, this scary, terrifying day that you're looking at in the Bible. This is a day that occurs after the rapture and when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth. And in that day, men are going to cast their no good idols to the moles and to the bats. But you need to read about this day of the Lord in the Bible and look at that phrase, in that day. Like I said, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years as a thousand years is one day. So it can be talking about, you know, the tribulation, the, the second coming when Jesus Christ comes back, and the millennial kingdom. You're looking at a thousand year time there that is called the day of the Lord in the Bible. Now notice that Isaiah 2.21, when those people hide in the rocks, that matches Revelation 6.16. See, what you're reading about in the Old Testament is prophecy. The Old Testament is not, is not just history. It's prophecy. But there's all kinds of occurrences of that phrase in the Bible. And I hope you're getting the picture. You shouldn't just be ready to leave this world on the sense you're ready to get out of it. 
but also in the sense that you're prepared to meet Almighty God. If you're lost and you go in the tribulation time period, you're going to see famine, famine, and you're going to see fire. These things will make it hard on the food supply. The fires in all, that were in Australia were, were nothing compared to what's going to be. The reaction over the coronavirus was nothing compared to what's going to be. You're going to see people going into hysteria. In Joel 1, 16 and 17 and 18, it says, Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods, so they can't grow anything. The garners, which is buildings where they store grain, are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed, because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. So animals will suffer. Animals have always suffered, because men are stupid and sinful. Sin, it, it just makes everybody suffer. Joel one nineteen and 20 says, O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And it just reminds you of what you read in Revelation. Revelation 8, 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up. And all green grass was burned up. You're going to have fire coming down on people in the tribulation time period. In Revelation 16, 9. And the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So you're going to have fire burning everything up at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 1, 8. In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Joel one twenty, The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of their wilderness. So the animals ain't got nothing to drink either. They ain't got no place to live in. The fire didn't ruined everything. And you could see videos of what those fires did to the animals. They just remind you of what will happen to them in the tribulation. And the, in the tribulation, the river Euphrates will be dried up so that the armies can, can gather together against the Lord Jesus Christ easier so we can kill them faster. But you see, Joel is such a prophetic book. It's going to line up with it, all kinds of stuff in the book of Revelation. But this has been a study on Joel chapter 1 on the subject of why I'm ready to leave this present evil world.